Thanks for spending the next seven minutes with me. I'm teaching about being sons, sons and daughters in God, not just children. My question today is, are we still on milk? Now, when we take communion, my wife and I take communion every single day. And when we're doing it, we're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 28. We examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves and, and see how we're doing it in our spiritual walk. And part of that examination is, are we still on milk? Now, the true gospel, we need to embrace this gospel, is the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace says that righteousness has been credited to our spiritual account as it was for Abraham and King David. Please do study Romans chapter 4 because in that chapter we find that Abraham and David did some pretty bad things. Abraham, for a start, pretended that Sarah, who was in fact his half-sister, she, he said, she's my sister. Now, that's the difference between half-sister and sister. And because of saying she was his sister, a heathen king, Abimelech, took her into his harem. She must have been a very beautiful elderly woman. Find that in Genesis 20 and verse 2. It was only by God warning the man in a dream that Sarah was not to be taken into his harem, but to restore this woman to her rightful husband. King David, of course, stole Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and arranged for Uriah to be killed in a battle. That's in 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 17. A big story there to go back and, and study. Now, despite these serious sins, both Abraham and King David were considered righteous because of their faith in God's grace. And in Romans 4, 16, very key verse in that chapter I advised you to read, they inherited God's promise because it's the outcome of faith. It depends entirely on faith in order that it may be given as an act of grace. So Abraham and his descendants, those who share in Abraham's faith, he's the father of us all, might have got it, understood that they're righteous because of faith in God's grace. It's an act of grace, nothing to do with their performance. Now, in the wonderful letter to the Hebrews, the co-writers, Paul, Barnabas, Apollos and Priscilla, severely scold those who have not grasped this basic fundamental truth of the new covenant. The gospel is based upon the righteousness by faith. And in Hebrews 5, the writers there say, you're like children still needing milk, not yet ready to digest solid food. For everyone who still continues to feed on milk is obviously inexperienced and unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness. He's a mere infant and not able to talk yet. Now, what exactly is milk? If you go on to read after Hebrews 5, you come to Hebrews 6. In the first two verses of Hebrews 6, is a list of things which I have put into a, a scheme, a course known as the Foundations of Faith. Many of you have actually studied that uh, course. But the key principle in that course is, do we know the doctrine of righteousness and do we know how to speak faith if we listen to the words that come out of our mouths at times we may shock ourselves because the opposite of faith is unbelief and we speak in unbelief speak in death just a simple analysis of how we talk shows up how influenced we are by the circumstances of life around us well, why are you so miserable under the circumstances? I'm not under the circumstances. Shows you where you are. Gives you a pinpoint a position spiritually. We need to be influenced by the word of God, not by the circumstances of life. Now, another teaching by the Apostle Paul is in his letter to the church at Corinth. And it, Corinth, and it uses a similar reference to milk. This is in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 3. Brethren, I couldn't talk to you as spiritual men, but as non-spiritual men of the flesh, 
in whom the carnal nature predominates. As mere infants, there he goes again, as those who are unable to talk, I fed you with milk because you are still unspiritual, you have the nature of the flesh, you're under the control of ordinary impulses, you're jealous, you're arguing about who's, who you support, which faction you're in, who's your spiritual leaders, you're behaving yourself after a human standard like mere unchanged men. I've paraphrased that a little bit. The, the actual verses are in your notes after the video. Not only does the apostle agree with the writer of the Hebrews, but he adds other criteria to help us check our spiritual maturity. What's it truly like? Are we impulsive? Well, I just went out and I spent 500 euros or hundred dollars on this. Why do you do it? Oh, I had an impulse. It's impulsive. And then we live with the consequences and the debt that comes with it. We Do we let our tongue be filled with jealousy and competitiveness as well as with unbelief? Many mature, so-called mature ministers of the gospel are far too involved in competitive assessment. How many are in your church now? Are you giving to overseas missions? Who's your main prophetic guide? Now, these questions may be guided by genuine interest or motivated by interest, but behind them is the making of a quick comparison by human standards. We, you know, how's your church doing? Who are you supporting? How much are you giving? We don't want to be assessed as being mere unchanged men and women. It's not time to stay as we are. It's time to realise that this type of thinking, Romans 8 verse 7, is not just immature. By this type of thinking, we actually make ourselves an enemy of God. God does not think like this. God is mature. We need to copy the way Christ thinks and uh, make ourselves of no reputation. We're just servants. That's who we are. Okay? More about this on my next video. I'm sure that's helped you today. God bless you and thanks for listening.